The Australian Special Air Service is famous for their elite training and commitment, making them one of the most highly trained operators in the military world. But what happens when some of these highly skilled warriors lose their way and deviate from the code of honor and duty they once upheld? For years, the secrets about what they did in the valleys, fields, and mud villages of Afghanistan have remained hidden. Until recently. In 2005, Australian Special Forces troops, including the SAS, were deployed to Afghanistan and remained there until 2013. Operating in five-man teams primarily within Aruzgan province, they undertook a variety of missions. However, throughout their deployment, disturbing allegations of misconduct, particularly within the SAS, began to emerge. Former SAS operative Braden Chapman, who had been on numerous covert missions, had made the decision to come forward and share his first-hand experiences. According to Chapman, some messed up stuff was happening with the Australian operators. They were going around shooting villagers' dogs, wrecking their stuff, and even planting radios and guns on deceased Afghans to make it seem like they were fighters. According to Chapman, there was a dark sense of humor within the unit, where jokes were made about sweeping everything bad under the rug. The prevailing sentiment was that one day, all the hidden truths would come to light and individuals would be held accountable for acts of killings or any other wrongdoings committed. As a signals intelligence officer assigned to 3 Squadron SAS, Chapman had a crucial mission of tracking insurgent targets. Within the ranks of the SAS, he observed a prevailing sense of elitism, creating an unmistakable aura and sense of pride associated with being part of the SAS. However, it didn't take long for him to be taken aback by the conduct of certain individuals among his comrades. In May 2012, the operators of 3rd Squadron SAS embarked on a mission to track down an elusive insurgent known for crafting deadly explosives. The Black Hawk helicopters landed about 90 meters away from the target location. With his dog by his side, the handler followed closely behind a fellow operator known as Oliver Schulz as they navigated through the field towards the muddy compound. The helicopters also provided valuable guidance, directing them to an individual who had been spotted in a wheat field up ahead. While the unit advanced towards the target building, they caught sight of an Afghan man leaving the area. Spotting their presence, the Afghan man's eyes widened in fear, triggering an instinctual response as he quickly turned and fled, desperately trying to put distance between himself and the operators. The dog handler commanded his dog companion to pursue the Afghan man. The dog took off, leading the way as two operators quickly followed, maneuvering through wheat and mud. Amidst the rough terrain, they came upon a bearded man in his 20s. He was subdued by the dog and was lying on the ground. The dog handler yelled at the dog to back off from the man and the dog released its hold, allowing Schultz to quickly shift his attention. Schultz aimed his M4 assault rifle at the man, maintaining a distance of a mere 1 to 2 meters. The man instinctively rolled onto his back, curling his legs up in a defensive posture. In his right hand is what appeared to be a set of red prayer beads. Schultz's weapon remained locked on his head, unwavering. Schultz finally averted his gaze, shifting his focus to the dog handler standing next to him, inquiring whether he would shoot him. The dog handler replied that he wasn't sure and he should ask the patrol commander who was nearby. Solch turned to the commander, repeating the same question about whether or not he should take the shot. The patrol commander's response was unintelligible as Schultz proceeded to discharge the first round, targeting the Afghan man lying on the ground. The dog suddenly rushed towards the Afghan man and the handler urgently commanded the dog to return. Schultz mercilessly fired two additional rounds in the Afghan man, killing him. The Afghan man's name was Dad Muhammad. Following a complaint lodged by tribal leaders, the Australian Defence Force launched an investigation into the killing of Dad Muhammad. They acquired helmet cam footage unveiling a striking disparity between the soldiers' testimonies provided to the ADF investigators and what is depicted in the video. Schultz, who had been responsible for shooting Dad Muhammad, asserted that the Afghan man was targeted due to his alleged possession of a radio. However, the footage fails to present any evidence of a radio, only capturing the prayer beads clutched in the man's hand. Schultz defended his actions, asserting that he fired in self-defense from a distance ranging between 15 to 20 meters. Contrary to Schultz's claims, the video footage depicts Dad Muhammad remaining motionless and calm on the ground for over 20 seconds. The grief-stricken father of the deceased expressed that Muhammad had been enduring immense hardships to provide for his family, which included his two daughters. Following the incident, Schultz was suspended from duty and subsequently stood trial. If found guilty, he could potentially be sentenced to life imprisonment. According to Chapman, there is a disturbing pattern of systematically placing weapons and radios near the deceased to justify their killings. Chapman further disclosed that firearms were also surreptitiously placed on dead Afghan individuals. In December 2012, an additional case involving the SAS unfolded, 
as they embarked on a mission to track down an insurgent target based on reliable information. Moving quickly and in collaboration with her Afghan counterparts, the Afghan commandos, the Australian SAS undertook the challenging task of reaching Sara'a, a small village nestled in the remote and demanding Shawali Khat region of Kandahar. Acting on a valuable tip-off, their mission was to track down and apprehend insurgents located in the small village. Team 1 descended from a Black Hawk helicopter, strategically landing near the village. At the same time, another helicopter carrying Team 2 maintained focus on the scattering individuals, including men and boys, in the field situated approximately 1 to 2 kilometers southeast of the target location. Inside the helicopter, the SAS patrol commander made a bold decision. He instructed the American door gunner to open fire on the Afghans below, aiming to prevent them from scattering. This action goes against the established Australian rules of engagement, but the American gunner disregarded such concerns. The Black Hawk pilot maneuvered in a sweeping arc and the gunner started firing shots around the Afghans. The impact of the rounds hitting the ground halted the Afghan farmers in their tracks. Many of them sought refuge near a tractor, where they had been engaged in loading onions just a moment ago. At this point, the other Black Hawk had landed in the field and the members of Team 1 began to disembark from the aircraft. As they stepped out, they wasted no time and quickly unleashed a barrage of gunfire at the farmers and civilians in the field. Later on, one of the SAS operators from that patrol would return to the base and inform the special operator's officer about what took place in that field around the tractor. The SAS operator explained that the patrol commander unintentionally shot one of the farmers in their group. Realizing the potential risks of leaving witnesses, they made the chilling determination to eliminate every single one of them, ensuring no one would be left behind to share the account of what had happened. It became a killing spree. Upon receiving information about the killings, the special operations officer proceeded to examine the photographs captured by the SAS patrol during the raid, showcasing the deceased individuals. The Brereton Report, a significant investigation released in 2020, presented irrefutable evidence of the grave misconduct by Australian elite soldiers during the Afghan war. The report conclusively revealed that 39 individuals had been unlawfully killed highlighting a severe breach of military conduct and ethical standards. The Australian Defence Force attributed the perpetration of these crimes to an unchecked warrior culture prevalent among a faction of soldiers, absolving them of individual accountability. Per the findings of the Brereton Report, senior command is largely absolved of any knowledge regarding the commission of war crimes. The report instead attributes the criminal activities and subsequent concealment to patrol commanders, typically of lower ranks such as sergeants or corporals and their mentees. It emphasizes that the responsibility of these actions lies primarily with a small group of patrol commanders and those under their guidance. According to the report, patrol commanders were seen as godlike by their operators, making it extremely difficult for anyone to speak up about their actions. These commanders were put on a pedestal and considered to be untouchable. The Brereton report highlights various shortcomings in oversight, the issue stemming from a prevailing warrior culture and the reliance on a limited pool of SAS soldiers who were repeatedly deployed over an extended period. The SAS enjoyed an unquestionable status, especially among outsiders, and a strong culture of secrecy within each patrol prevented their actions from being known by others. The report highlighted that complaints raised by locals and human rights groups were often disregarded as mere insurgent propaganda or as attempts to seek financial compensation. As the revelations from the Brereton report unfolded, it became apparent that the Australian Special Air Service had veered off the path of honor and duty. But let us know what you think about the situation in the comments section below, and thanks for watching.